First of all, thank you for the presentation. I would like to thank I would like to thank the president of the um, Pontian, Pontian Federation and all the colleagues who are present with whom I've shared many things. Distinguished participants, we have um, covered some points uh, But taking the legal aspect, I will touch upon these points that have been heard or have been shown on the screen. I would like to thank also the uh, young people of the um, Pontian Federation. It is really a first because it opens up a new era for the Pontian issue. For many years, the uh, Pontus Greeks have been characterized by introversion and a silent wailing. As Mr. Sirigo said, we have reached the third or fourth generation of Pontus Greeks and they try to find the truth and the right to memory is fully recorded. The state has embraced this conference and this is really very important. After all these years, when the from since the 1920s when the refugees came back greece is uh, very very submissive towards turkey and has kept a very low profile greece has been waiting to have a friendship relationship but the uh, provocative stance of Turkey is constant. So maybe we should try and think about the way we view our neighbors, especially as regards the Pontian issue. We have been waiting for a better international juncture in order to put forward the requests of the Pontian issue, a juncture with new um, relationships and uh, balances of power. I will talk about not so much about uh, history. I will touch upon the legal aspect, the legal framework that shapes, that governs rather this crime of genocide. The trauma of Pontians and the other uh, ethnic populations is very, very deep. It's a very deep wound. And with this conference, it further documents more, documents more the events that took place. I will not verify and I will not present these events. These events are there. They are there. I can refer you for a very detailed presentation of these events to the work of Professor Fotiadis as regards Pontus. And from the international literature, I can uh, refer you to a, an outstanding piece of work by Benny Morris and his colleague in the University of Ben Gurion, Professor Zevi, who talks about the 30-year genocide that took place until uh, from 1894 to 1924, which documents fully and in 
a very scientific way these events and presents them in a synthetic way in order to draw conclusions. So I can refer you to these two um, pieces of work, to these two books as regards the events per se. So now let me come to the legal aspects, the legal issues that I would like to uh, provide an answer to. The legal issues are three, three major questions. The first one is whether, on the basis of the historic material in hand, on the basis of the events uh, that we talked about, whether we can fully substantiate the crime of genoc genocide the way this crime is described in Article 2 of the UN uh, Convention of 1948. The second question is whether there is a uh, jurisdiction body that could issue a judgment on the basis of international law. And the third question, you uh, raised it to Mr. Topalidis, is the issue of retroactiveness, whether retroactive character, whether international law and the International Convention of 1948 could be uh, used for the case of uh, the genocide of Armenians, of uh, Pontus Greeks, and Assyrians, Chaldeans. Just two words. as regards history. These three ethnicities have been established in these uh, territories where they have been uh, thrown out. They were established there from very ancient times, that is 2500 BC until 800 for the various ethnicities. So their establishment there is very, very old, without interruption. And we have high uh, examples of high civilization, autonomous governance, organization, and uh, ruling in these territories. A very crucial fact is that these three ethnicities converted to Christianism already from the early Christian times. And they were converted to Christianism by the apostles themselves. This is the common element that connects them since that time. Of course, these three uh, peoples, let me call them like that, from the fall of Trebizond in 1461, and the fall of the Byzantine Empire, these three peoples were under Ottoman rule, and they live a life which is oppressive, and they have become second-rate citizens, and even lower. However, in more recent times, and this is why, this is why many escaped and fled to other countries, and some others were converted to Islam. And we heard from the previous speakers what it means to be converted to Islam, and how this leaves uh, traces, very serious traces, in these areas and goes back to the times not only of the genocide but even to years before that. In 1856, with Hati Humayun, which was a charter of revision of things in order to, for the peoples under Ottoman rule to have some uh, freedoms, this revived their spirits. However, the Ottoman Empire, which was going down the drain, as it were, 
uh, during this century, in the 18th uh, hundred, this creates a lot of tension in this area. The great powers compete with each other who will benefit most and who will get most from the uh, decline of the Sultan, who was the great patient, as it were, he was called at that time. The reaction to this was the uh, getting together of uh, officers in Istanbul, Constantinople at that time, and then in Paris some years later, where they established the uh, Committee uh, Union and Progress, which is the main uh, thing of the young Turks. And Mustafa Kemal Ataturk joins with them in 1907. And they are quite popular. They control the state and the army. So these people issue a declaration. And this is a piece of paper which is of great importance if you want to study the ideology of young Turks. So they declared the Osman theory. which meant one race, one religion, one governor, government. The Osman theory, Osmanism theory, if you find it, uh, I mean, you can find it, it is uploaded. And this theory reveals the whole theory and ideology of young Turks. Following this declaration, the Armenian, uh, the massacre of Armenians had already started, 1896, and then persecution, persecutions and cleansing starts towards all these uh, ethnicities, all these populations. But what was it? And this is something described very, very uh, eloquently by uh, the two authors I mentioned before. What is the crucial element not put forward by historians, not put forward so much, rather? It's the religious beliefs. They were Christians. And those who participated in the persecutions and cleansings had in front of their eyes this uh, person, this model of person that they had to cleanse. So apart from the regulars who participated in the massacres, the Chets, there were the priests, the Muslim priests who declared the holy war, the jihad against the Christian populations. So this jihad provoked atrocities and acts unseen before. I mean, the humanity has seen them before because this is not the first genocide. But these are, this is the type of acts that we call atrocities. Systematic executions, cleansings, the white death marches, the Auschwitz in flow, as Nebekidi said, rapes of women, conversion of children to Islam and making them Turks, abductions, and innumerable crimes and unspeakable crimes. The documentation of these acts is based on lots and lots and lots of books and literature and sources, converging sources coming from the archives of European countries, of the US, Russia, the Patriarchate, missionaries, and of course, a very, very rich material that really shocks. 
And of course, we have the memory of families, the people who have heard from their ancestors terrible histories, and we have literature with these elements. Now I come to the purely legal part. These acts are prosecuted based on Article 2 of the 1948 Convention. This is a convention established, agreed upon, following the tragic experience of Nazism against the Jews and after the Holocaust. The great jurist and humanitarian, Raphael Lemkin, who has shown also the repercussions, the impact of genocides, which lead to a demographic alteration of populations worldwide. worldwide. He waged the battle in order to establish this crime against humanity in 1948. In the Nuremberg trials, there is no um, talking about this crime, nor in Tokyo. At that time, the term used was crime against humanity. And this is the statute based on which uh, the uh, Nuremberg trials were held. Now, this crime raises some important problems. And as you said, Mr. Chairman, nulum crinem nulum penem is indeed a premise, a legal premise, which is uh, in force in criminal law. This crime was not recorded at the time in the 40s. But we have to see first whether what we see in each crime, which is the objective and the subjective aspect and substance, we have to see whether these two components to characterize a crime, we have to see whether they are uh, true in the case of this genocide, the genocide against these three Christian populations. The crimes mentioned in Article 2 is group murder, uh, murder of uh, members of a group. It's the attempt against these people the conditions that are uh, imposed and which lead to the destruction of this group. It's the violent change of ethnicities and, of course, the execution of people due to their religious beliefs. All the cases that we have seen in Pontus, in Armenia, in the mountains where the Assyrians were established in Iraq around Mesopotamia, all these crimes around this period correspond to the crime of genocide. So we can say that this crime was committed. There are innumerable proofs, innumerable evidence about this. I gave you the data before. However, if we examine the objective um, substance uh, of this crime, I have to clarify that the notion of crew, group is the crucial element. This crucial element is there because the group as a notion in its core, it's not what the group does, but what the group is from the beginning or due to its um, inclusion, its incorporation, uh, as it were, in a religion. So 
the core of the crime is what the group is. The International uh, Tribunal in The Hague, the International uh, Criminal Court in Rome and The Hague Tribunal have ruled that the notion of a group can have a, substan a subjective character. And this is a case law which has reached this point after some time. Because at the beginning, they considered only the group that exists from the beginning. So even groups which have been formed uh, by a belief, they are included in this notion. As regards now the objective character, I would like to make a clarification regarding, regarding the ethnic cleansing that we mentioned before. The events, a revisionist, uh, revisionist perception of history, has deemed that the characterization ethnic cleansing, cleansing is milder than genocide. And this term was used in order to avoid the term genocide, which is very acute and very harsh. However, this crime as ethnic cleansing does not exist. Such a crime had not been uh, set up, but the term has been used by the Security Council and by the International uh, Criminal Court, uh, Criminal Tribunal. So it is used, but we have to distinguish that ethnic cleansing aims at the violent deportation, violent displacement of a population from a territory, from a country, from an area. The distinguishing feature between ethnic cleansing and genocide is putting to death. When there is putting to death, and especially of the scale that we have seen in these three cases, I could even add the Jews or any other, which are genocides beyond doubt, then we cannot talk about ethnic cleansing. We are talking about purely genocide, and in this case, it is a triple genocide. Now, let me come to the subjective character of this crime. Here, we have the most serious issues because we have to impute this crime to some persons. We have to have persons in front of us, but this case that we are examining does not help very simply because all the persons of the time, all the perpetrators, and we know them all, We heard about the Armenian and how uh, the Armenian uh, genocide and how they were executed in order to pay for what they did following the cleansing. And three Turkish uh, courts had uh, condemned them to death, but they did not uh, proceed to the execution. So this point leaves us. Uh, with the impossibility to impute the crime to anyone, because none of them is still alive. So what happens in this case? Here, I have to say, I have to refer to some uh, rulings of the International uh, Tribunal in The Hague. In two recent, uh, rather recent rulings, one is the Ilzik uh, ruling and the other is the Croatia against Yugoslavia. 
the international uh, tribunal has accepted that a state that has legal interest may enter a case to the international tribunal for this issue. That is, beyond the personal responsibility of people, the international tribunal recognized the possibility uh, to have a state which is responsible, which is liable. So any country, such as Armenia or Greece, but even other countries, because this is a common a global good, any country could have recourse to the Hague Tribunal. There is lawful interest, and the court is compelled to uh, issue a judgment. Now, let me come to the third question, the retroactiveness. This is the most serious of all. Why? Because it was considered that the 1948 Convention cannot be implemented, cannot, be, cannot apply to time before the signing of the Convention. So this is a ruling of the International Tribunal, which constitutes an impediment to all this wish to bring this case to a judgment. But there are many serious arguments in favor of the opposite view. Given that this judgment, which was repeated twice, is a very positivistic perception of law and leaves no ground for exceptional cases. Mr. Yetaranzidis, I just like to remind you that we are running out of time, says the chairperson. This is what happens in the end, uh, always. Anyway, um, there is a counter-argument. Mr. Sirigos uh, touched upon it, and I support the same view. That is, that the rule of law, which was not established, it was declared based on the uh, convention, which means that it pre-existed, and pre-existed means pre-existed as a custom during the years that we examine. It pre-existed as a custom and then it was codified with the International Convention of 1948. This is a serious argument, but the tribunal refuted it, considering that if we consider that it was codified, the tribunal is competent to examine the convention and not the custom because the uh, imputation in the States takes place after the acceptance of the Convention by the States. And this took place after 1948. I will not uh, dwell more on that, but I just want to say that following a different interpretation by the court or any other uh, body could consider that for such a right, uh, right for all people, the protection of life, has to be included in the exceptional cases. And the International Convention on the Interpretation of the Treaty of Geneva in 1969 is such a case. This is a crucial element. And also the irrefutability of this right, it shows that this right is timeless towards the future and towards the past. Even Turkey itself, during that time, had the constitutional obligation to protect its citizens during these years we're talking about. And we have this elementary rule that a state cannot exterminate whole populations that constitute subjects of this state. 
this state is a subject of international law. Therefore, here we have obligations vis-à-vis -vis the international community and international justice can handle them. However, in order to be realists, in the International uh, Tribunal of The Hague, one cannot have recourse, recourse with many hopes. I would like to say that there are some other possibilities which could be, for instance, uh, having recourse to the Council of Human Rights of the United Nations. Mr. De Zayas, who is um, connected to this council, will tell us about it. The prerequisites in order to uh, have recourse there will not lead to a uh, ruling. And um, this council does not have a uh, jurisdiction. Another possibility would be a request to the, to the Security Council or the uh, Council of the United Nations to ask from the court an opinion uh, expressed on this. So a very brief conclusion. The fight, the combat so far to recognize the genocides which has yielded results by many uh, nations, by many states, by states in the US, by the European uh, Parliament. This is a path that could help. And through the uh, people who realize this, we could proceed to the uh, vindication of these uh, requests of these three peoples. And as you know, there is also uh, penal protection and the criminalization of doubting the genocide. This is a law and this is a path and we have this duty ahead. Thank you very much. We thank Mr. Panagiotis Yetagantzidis. This